Okay, so the next uh, segment of our award ceremony is the Climate Pioneer Award. This is only the second Climate Pioneer Award we have given out, with the first going to w William K. Riley back in the before times of the early 2020 at our last in-person Climate Leadership Conference and Award Ceremony. Today, it is my great honor to announce that Mary Nichols is a 2022 Climate P Pioneer recipient. Uh, we have been privileged at the Climate Registry to have had a long-standing relationship with Mary. She is the Climate Registry's co-founder, along with TCR's first executive director, Diane Wittenberg, uh, who's also here with us today. Diane, thank you. Uh, and, and Mary has also been um, a longtime board member, actually, of since the Climate Registry was formed. So we're very thankful for her leadership and involvement uh, with, the, with the development and support of the Climate Registry all these years. I can't think of a better way to honor Mary than starting with video remarks from former TCR board member and Mary's longtime friend and colleague in the climate change fight, fight Gina McCarthy. I'm so excited for the opportunity to be with you, if only virtually, as you receive this award. You have been a mentor, a colleague, a partner in crime, in a good way, and a trusted friend to me and to so many colleagues who share your passion for a clean and healthy world and for public service. Congratulations on the Climate Pioneer Award. But let me start by confessing that when I heard you were receiving a Pioneer Award, what immediately popped into my mind was you in a covered wagon with one of those silly bonnets on. And of course, you were driving. Not exactly the kind of zero emission vehicle that you tend to be associated with. And that picture is just really hard to turn off in your head, isn't it? But Mary, you are a pioneer in every sense of the word. You have managed to live a rich, value-laden, and purpose-driven life. You have worked with hundreds, if not thousands, of colleagues like me, who know in our heart of hearts and in our minds that there is simply no one who comes close to you as a leader and innovator. And when it comes to clean air and climate change, you've been the most cutting edge, politically savvy, influential driver of change in this country, and arguably the world. During your amazing career, Mary, you refused to ignore the science, and you have never failed to push the law as far as you could go to bend it towards a healthier and more secure future. All through your career, Mary, you've pushed technologies beyond what most people thought achievable, much to the chagrin of folks who love the status quo and took every opportunity to use the courts to try to stifle innovation. But what they failed to understand was you knew the laws and regulations better than they did, and you were absolutely fearless and unrelenting in pushing for innovation, not just in technology solutions, but in policies and practices that would drive change. Your work is a testament to the steady, smart leadership that our democracy demands if we hope to keep up with changes in the world most notably the challenge of climate change, which we all know is the existential challenge of our time. And because of you, Mary, your beloved state of California, many other states as well, took early and decisive actions that have saved so many lives as our ear became cleaner and as the fight against climate change began. In fact, as you well know, partnerships among states built an unbreakable foundation for climate progress that could not be weakened, a foundation for climate actions that we must keep working hard to accelerate at the scope and pace that science demands at every level of government and internationally. Mary, you are a true pinheaded bureaucrat, and coming from me, that is the highest praise I can give. You found a way to nurture thoughtful, life-saving change as you worked in the Clinton administration and over your decades at the helm of CARB, working under the most amazing cast of governors imaginable. Mary, in so many ways, you've led the charge even in the early years when climate change wasn't cool, pun intended. 
But that's why this recognition of your service and of you individually is just so fitting. You are being honored as the second recipient of the Climate Pioneer Award, and rightly so, because during your years of public service and Bill Riley's years of public service, you have moved beyond what could ever have been expected of you. Your continued work at UCLA Law and your work at Columbia Global Energy Program and the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future is, is at your effort to continue to prepare the next generation who can tackle our climate crisis. And it's just one more testament to the richness of your spirit and your bottomless energy. So Mary, congratulations on the award, but more than that, we all are here to celebrate your life. Thanks for everything you've done. Big hugs to you virtually. Take care. I'd now like to welcome another very good friend and colleague of uh, TCR, C2ES, and Mary's, Vicki Arroyo. Vicki, who currently now serves as Associate Administrator for Policy at the EPA. Prior to joining EPA, Vicki served as Executive Director of the Georgetown Climate Center, where she was also Professor at Georgetown Law and Director of the Environmental Law and Policy Program. Vicki? Hi, good afternoon. Gina is a hard act to follow, even virtually. Wasn't that amazing? Another round of applause for Gina. It is so wonderful to be here among so many friends and climate champions and to honor a true climate leader. I know I'm preaching to the choir in this crowd, but we all need to be doing everything we possibly can to address the climate crisis. And I can't think of anyone who has done as much to help our nation confront the climate crisis as Mary Nichols. Mary is widely recognized for her career as one of the world's foremost environmental regulators. She was honored by Time Magazine in 2013 as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. She's been described by former EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson as the Thomas Edison of environmentalism. She served in significant environmental and natural resource leadership positions at both the state and federal levels and in both Democratic and Republican in administrations. It took me a minute to say that, right? <laughs> uh, first appointed to serve on California Air Resources Board by Governor Jerry Brown in 1975, she chaired the board from 1979 to 1982 and again from 2007 to 2020. Mary was responsible for implementing effectively and on time some of the most complex and innovative air quality programs in the nation and the world. While Mary was serving as the state's top regulator for air, she cut emissions, California cut emissions of planet warming gases back to 1990 levels in 2016, meeting the statewide goal four years ahead of schedule. Thanks largely to Mary's and CARB's efforts, California has succeeded in decoupling greenhouse gas emissions from economic growth and has shown us what can and what must be done. <clears throat> Under Mary's leadership, CARB enacted the first comprehensive cap on industrial greenhouse gas emissions by any major regulatory agency in the world. She was leading the way and inspiring the rest of us. During her tenure, the board launched low carbon fuel regulations and multiple rounds of clean vehicle standards that went beyond federal requirements and helped spur technologies and approaches that benefit clean air and climate well beyond California, as others from across the country and around the world follow California's lead. Mary in California led the way on vehicle standards with a landmark zero emission vehicle mandate back in 1990 and the nation's first greenhouse gas emission standards for cars in 2004. In 2012, CARB implemented California's Advanced Clean Cars program, which reduces both conventional criteria pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles. In 2020, CARB, under Mary's leadership, issued the Advanced Clean Trucks rule, which mandates that an increasing percentage of trucks sold in California be zero emission vehicles. When President Trump 
sought to relax federal standards and revoke California's waiver to set its own clean car rules, Mary helped secure commitments from the major automakers to follow California's latest standard. Thanks to her air board leadership and service over a course of decades, cars, trucks, and buses spew less particulate matter and gases into the air, port and rail yard pollution has declined, consumer products have been reformulated, and electric vehicle sales have climbed. Largely due to Mary's influence, California for decades now has been a path setter. And in many ways, she's defined what the future looks like in US policy around transportation and greenhouse gas emissions. In addition to her amazing tenure at the helm of CARB and serving as Secretary of California's Natural Resources Agency under Governor Gray Davis, President Clinton appointed Mary to be the Assistant Administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation in 1993. At EPA, Mary was responsible for many regulatory innovations, including the acid rain training program, tighter health standards for smog, and the first national emissions for dangerous fine particulate matter. It was in her role as AA in the mid-90s when I first met Mary and saw her brilliance as a strategist firsthand. Just a personal anecdote on that. My son attended EPA's early environments daycare as a baby, back in the era of EPA being at Waterside Mall, remember? The babies would occasionally be loaded into a wagon to stroll the halls of EPA to the delight of all who encountered them. On the day I have in mind, Mary, as the air chief, was called up to the administrator's office for what could have been a difficult conversation about a topic that I don't recall. It's probably just as well all these years later. <laughs> she asked to borrow our then roly-poly baby, Jack, and took him with her to see Administrator Browner. <laughs> Carol, upon seeing him, immediately forgot what else she wanted. <laughs> and she joined the fun with Mary of cooing and holding him. Mary, very clever, very strategic. <laughs> Beyond her government service, Mary's reach includes serving in prominent roles at leaning climate centers, academic institutions, and think tanks. As you heard, Mary serves on the board as one, and was one of the founders of the Climate Registry, which does so much great work to advance efforts to confront the climate crisis. And I want to thank our partners at the Climate Registry over the years. In, in my old role at Georgetown, we partnered on, on uh, taking states to the COP and know all the great work you do. And of course, C2ES, where I came from at the Pew Center. Uh, Nat, thank you for having me here, and to all the sponsors for supporting this conference. Mary's been a founding mother of not just TCR, but of several prominent climate centers, including the one I led at Georgetown. And she was also a distinguished visiting faculty member there, delighting our students and faculty with her presence. She currently serves as distinguished counsel for UCLA's Emmett Institute on Climate Change, as co-chair for the Commission on the Future of Mobility, and vice chair for former Cal California Governor Jerry Brown's California and China Institute. She holds visiting appointments at Columbia University Center on Global Energy Policy and Cornell's Atkinson Center, as you heard from Gina. In these roles and beyond, Mary continues to not only advance innovative climate policy, but she's instrumental in training and shaping the next generation of climate leaders. In 2020, she was recognized by being elected as a member of the prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Mary's work has touched the lives of every single person in this room, in California, in the country and in the world. Regulations promulgated under her leadership have been adopted by our states, our federal government, even other countries. Among Mary's many strengths, two that have helped her achieve so much are her tenacity and pragmatism. And she's put those traits to great use in a way that's benefited each and every one of us. She's also been a trusted mentor and role model for so many of us in the environmental field. She's shown us what is possible and how it's possible to gracefully raise a family and become a doting grandmother, all while saving the world. There's so much more I can say about Mary and her achievements, but it would take hours. So I think the best thing I can say now is thank you. Thank you, Mary, for everything you've done to fight the climate crisis and protect the environment. We all owe you so much. It's my great honor to present you with the Climate Pioneer Award on behalf of the Climate Registry. Thank you. 
Nobody bothered to mention my fabulous fashion sense, uh, <laughs> having worn a jacket that matches the award. <laughs> it was a beautiful award. Thank you so much. I really cannot follow those two incredible women, and the adjectives that got piled on are just like a little overwhelming. Um, I do want to thank both organizations, um, both C2ES and my beloved Climate Registry for having um, given me this award. And I also want to say a word of thanks to the Bloomberg Philanthropies for supporting this conference as well, because I think uh, uh, in their own unique way, which involves writing very large checks to underwrite many good things, um, they too have seen how we can push the envelope on climate action. And they're doing it in part by having you all be able to hear to listen to each other, be here and listen to each other, and help strengthen your own networks as well. Um, it's no longer a, a, the least bit uh, surprising when you hear people talk about how you can have a good economy and a clean environment, or how we can move ahead on climate and do it in a way that actually can benefit the economy as well as um, dealing with the existential crisis that is climate change. And it's no longer news to anybody to say that the United States must play and can play and will play uh, a leading role in all of that. But I think um, if you had told me at least a decade or two ago, certainly, that you would see the kind of leadership coming from the private sector that we are seeing and that was recognized earlier today, as well as from the states and from local governments, uh, and the urgency of the demands that people are making to see changes in policy that will make these things a reality, I would have been, uh, I would have been surprised. And I do believe that everywhere I've been in the last uh, day and a half or so and listening to people talk about what needs to happen, um, we have to be on the brink of reinventing the way we do policy around uh, these issues or we won't succeed and all the good work that you all are doing um, is at risk. I can't believe that we're not going to find a way to overcome the obstacles. It will take maybe some invention, some <laughs> new ways of doing things uh, that will challenge the pinheaded bureaucrats uh, who need to be challenged uh, from time to time and they also need support. When I think about what enabled me to be a part of all the things that I've, you've just heard about, of, which of course I did not do by myself, but did with assistance and support and information coming from you know hundreds and thousands of individuals. Um, it's the fact that we had political leadership in California and at the national level uh, from people who were willing to listen to what maybe wasn't being said by uh, their fellow elected officials all the time, but which they knew uh, was important, and that was that the people really wanted and would remember them for what they did uh, for the environment and for, uh, for uh, the actions that they were willing to take, even if in the moment, uh, in the heat of the moment, I frequently heard from my bosses, you know, you want to do what, <laughs> and uh, exactly who is supporting what you're, uh, what you're trying to do out there? And the answer was often not very many in comparison with the lobbyists that were lined up on the other side, or just the fear of change, the fear of change, as Gina mentioned. But we're in a time of change where we can't avoid action, and so, I'm looking at you out there in the audience, and I'm counting on you to not just be here to um, applaud for me, but to go back to what you're doing with even more vigor and uh, keep up the good fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary and Vicki, and congratulations, Mary, and to all our Hall of Fame inductees, and thank you for your perseverance 
And um, as Mary said, there's much work still to be done, and so we hope that this conference has inspired you to go back to your day jobs and, and continue the great work that you're doing. Uh, right now, I also wanted to thank our, pa our partners and sponsors of the conference and the award ceremony. We really appreciate your support and your dedication to our initiative and our effort um, over the past decade. Uh, we now will have a 30-minute break uh, before today's plenary session, which will begin at 1.45. So we'll see you back there then. Thank you, everybody.